From the CUBE studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a CUBE Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to this special CUBE Conversation. We're here in the Palo Alto studios, or I am, here during this critical time during the coronavirus and this work at home, current situation across the United States and around the world. We've got a great interview here today around cybersecurity and the threats that are out there, the threats that are changing as a result of the current situation. We've got two great guests, Derek Mankey, Chief Security Insights and Global Threat Alliances at FortiGuard Labs and Renee Tarun, Deputy Chief Information Security Officer with Fortinet. Guys, thanks for remotely coming in. Obviously we're working remotely. Thanks for, for joining me today on this really important conversation. Thanks for having us. So yeah. Renee and Derek, Renee, I want to start with you as a, as a deputy CISO. Um, there's always been threats. Every day is a crazy day, but now more than ever over the past 30 to 45 days, we've seen a surge in activity with remote workers. Everyone's working at home. It's disrupting families' lives, how people do business. And also they're connected to the internet. So it's an endpoint. It's, it's, a, it's a hackable environment. We've had different conversations with you guys about this, but now more than ever, it's an at scale problem. What is the impact of the current situation for that problem statement of we're working at home at scale? Are there new threats? What's happening? Yeah, I think you're seeing, um, you know, some organizations have always traditionally had that work at, at home, um, you know, ability. But now what you're seeing is now entire workforces that are working home. And now, you know, some companies are, are scrambling to ensure that they have, you know, a secure work at home for teleworkers at scale. Um, in addition, you know, some organizations that never had a work from home uh, practice are now being forced into that. And so a lot of organizations you now are faced with the challenge that, you know, employees are now bringing their own device um, into the, the connecting to their, their networks because, you know, um, you know, employees can't be bringing their, their workstations home with them. And if they don't have a company laptop, they're of course using their, um, their own personal devices. And some of these, some personal devices are used by their kids. They're going out to gaming sites that could be impacted with malware. So it creates a lot of uh, different challenges from a security perspective that a lot of organizations aren't necessarily been faced for us, not only from a security, but also from a scalability uh, perspective. You know, um, when I'm at home working and I had to come in, I came into the studio to do this interview because I really wanted to, to talk to you guys. But when I'm at home this past couple of weeks, my kids are home, my daughter's watching Netflix, my son's gaming, multiplayer gaming. The surface area from a personnel standpoint or people standpoint is increased. My wife's working at home, my daughter's there, two daughters. So this is also now a social issue because there are more people on the Wi-Fi. there's more bandwidth being used, there's more fear. This has been an opportunity for the hackers, this, this um, the crime of fear using the, um, the current situation. So is it changing how you guys are recommending people protect themselves at home or is it just accelerating a core problem that you've seen before? Yeah, so, so I, I, I think um, it's, not, it's not changing. It's changing in, in a terms of priority. I mean, all, all the things that we've talked about before are just becoming much more critical, I think, at this point in time. If you look at, if you look at any histories that we've, um, you know, lessons we've learned from the past or haven't learned, <laughs> um, that, that's something that, that is just front and center right now. I mean, we've seen attack campaigns on any high level news, uh, anything that's been front and center, and, and we've seen successful attack campaigns in the past. Going to, to any sort of, sort of high pro, profile events, we had Olympic Destroyer last year, or sorry, last, last Olympic period, uh, when we had them in, in Korea, as an example, in South Korea, uh, we've seen, uh, you know, going, I, I could go back 10 years plus uh, and give like a history timeline every single year, there's been something dominating the news. Yeah. And there's been attack campaigns that are leveraged on that. Obviously this is a much higher focus now, given the global news domination that's happening with COVID. COVID, the heightened fear and anxiety. Uh, just the other day, FortiGuard Labs, we pulled up over 600 different, 600 different phishing uh, emails and scam attempts for COVID-19 and we're actively pouring through those. Um, I expect that number to increase. Um, everybody is trying to hop on this bandwagon. I was just talking to our teams in the labs today. Groups that we haven't seen active since about 2011, 2012, you know, malware campaign authors, um, they're riding this bandwagon right now as well. So there's just, it's it's really, it's really a, a, a suction, if you will, for for these uh, cyber criminals. So all the all of, all the things that we recommend uh, in, in the past, obviously being uh, uh, 
being vigilant, looking at those links coming in. Obviously, there's a lot of impersonators. There's a lot of spoofing out there, people uh, pretending to be the World Health Organization. We wrote a blog on this um, a couple of weeks back. Um, it's uh, really, uh, people have to have this zero trust mentality coming in. Um, there's everyone trying to, to ride on this, especially on social networks, on emails, even phishing and, and voice uh, phishing, so, so the voice phishing. Yeah. Um, you really have to, to put more, um, you know, people have to put more um, of a safeguard up, um, not only for their personal health, like everyone's doing the social distancing, but also virtual social distancing yeah. when it comes to really uh, trusting who's trying to send you these links. Well, I'm glad you guys have the FortiGuard labs there. And I think uh, folks watching should check it out and, and keep sending us that data. I think watching the data is critical. Everyone's watching the data. They want the real data. You brought up a good point, and Renee, I want to get your thoughts on this because the at scale thing is really gets my attention because there's more people at home, as I mentioned, from a social construct standpoint. Uh, work at home is opening up new uh, challenges for companies that haven't been prepared. Even the ones that are prepared have now an at scale. So you have a spectrum of, of challenges. The social engineering is the big thing on phishing. You're seeing all kinds of heightened awareness. It is a crime of opportunity for hackers, like Derek just pointed out. What's your uh, advice? What's your vision of what's happening? How do you see it evolving? And what can people do to protect themselves? What's the key threats and what, are, what steps are people taking? Yeah, I think it's like Derek said, you know, kind of similar how in the, the physical world, you know, we're washing our hands, we're keeping, you know, six feet away from people. We kind of keep a distance from our adversaries as well. Um, again, you know, you, when you're looking at your your emails, you know, in, ensuring that you know you're only opening attachments from people that you know, you know, hovering over the links to ensure that they are from legitimate sources, um, and being mindful that when you know you're seeing these type of attacks coming in, whether they are coming through your emails, through your phones, you know, take a moment and pause and, and think about you know. You know, would someone be contacting me through my cell phone, through sending me a text message um, or emails, asking me for personal information, asking me for, you know, you know user IDs and, and passwords, credential inf information. Um, so you kind of need to take that second and, and really think, um, you know, before you start taking actions. And similar to opening attachments, we've seen a lot of cases where, you know, someone, you know, attaches a, a PDF file to an email um, but when you open up the, the, the PDF, it, it's actually malware. Um, so you need to be careful and, and think to yourself, was I expecting this attachment? Do I know the person? And, um, and take steps to actually follow up and call that person directly and say, hey, did you really send this to me? You know, is this le legitimate? Um, yeah, you got to be careful what you're, got to be careful what you're opening up, which links you click on. But while I got you here, I want to get your opinion on this because there's, there's digital attacks and then there's phone based attacks. We all have mobile phones. Um, I know this might be a little bit too uh, elementary, but I want to get it out there. Can you define the difference between phishing and spear phishing for the folks that are trying to understand the difference between uh, phishing and spear phishing techniques? Yeah, the, the main difference is spear phishing is really targeting a specific individual um, or within a specific role within a company. Um, for example, targeting like the CEO or the CFO. Um, so those are attacks that are specifically targeting a specific individual or specific role. Where phishing emails are targeting just mass people, um, regardless of you know their roles and responsibilities. So I'm reading the blog post that you guys put out, which I think everyone, I'll put the link on Silicon Angle later, but it's on Fortinet.com. Under digital attacks, you've got the phishing and spear phishing, which is you know, general targeting email or individually spear, spearing someone specifically. But you guys list social media deception, pretexting, and water holing as the key areas. Um, is that just based on statistics or just the, te the techniques that people are using? And you guys, can you guys comment on, react to those uh, different techniques? Yeah, so so I think with the um, so so the water holing specifically as well, the water holing attack uh, refers to people that are uh, every day uh, as part of their routine going to some sort of usually a news source, it could be their favorite site, social media, etc. Those sorts of sources, because it's expected for people to go and drink from a water hole, um, are are prime targets to to these attackers. So those are mostly for um, they can be definitely used for for spear fishing, but also for for the masses, for these phishing campaigns, those are more um, effective. You know, attackers like to cast a wide net, um, and uh, you know, it's it's um, it, it's especially effective if you think of the climate that's happening right now. Um, like you said earlier uh, at the start of this conversation, that that expanded um, attack surface and also the usage of of 
uh, of bandwidth and more platforms and, and applications. More, there's more traffic going to these sites simply. People have um, more time at home through telework to be able to, to virtually go to these sites. And so, um, again, usually what we see in these water holding uh, attacks can be definitely uh, phishing sites that are set up on, 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 on these pages because um, they might have been compromised themselves. So this is something even for... Uh, uh, people who are hosting these websites, right? There's always yeah. two sides of the coin to security. You have your client side security and your server side security. So, so if spear phishing is targeting an individual, water holding is the net that gets a lot of people and then they go from there. Yeah. Um, can you yeah. guys, uh, uh, Renee and, and, or, or Derek, talk about social media deception and pretexting? These are other techniques as well that are popular. Can you guys comment and define those? Yeah, I mean, so the the some of the pretexting that, that you're seeing is, you know, what's happening is adversaries are, you know, either, um, you know, sending texts, um, you know, trying to get people to click on links, um, go to, to malicious sites. Um, and they're also going, setting up um, these fabricated stories um, and they're trying to um, call, um, you know, acting like they're a, um, a legitimate source, um, and again, trying to use tactics and a lot of times uh, scare tactics, um, trying to get people to divulge information, personal information, credit card numbers, social security numbers, um, user IDs and passwords um, to gain access um, to either- So misinformation, so misinformation campaigns now. would be an example of that, like I got a COVID virus vaccine, you know, put your credit card down now and get on the mailing list or, is that, the, is that kind of the, the general gist there? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and we've also seen as an, another example, and this was in a, one of our blogs, I think about a couple of weeks ago, some of the first waves of these attacks that we saw was also, again, uh, impersonating to be the World Health Organization as part of pretexting, saying that there's uh, important alerts and updates that these readers must read in their regions, but they're of course malicious documents that are attached. Yeah, I mean, how do people just get educated on this? This is really challenging because you know, um, if you're a nerd like us, you can know what a URL looks like and you can tell it's a host serve, host name, it's not real. But when they're embedded in these social networks, is how do you know? What's the big challenge? Just education and kind of awareness? Yeah, so um, I'll just jump in quickly on that. For you know, from my point of view, it's 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 the whole ecosystem, right? So it's not there's no just one silver bullet. Uh, education, cyber hygiene, for sure. Uh, but beyond that, obviously, this is where the security solutions step in. So having that layered defense, right, that that goes a long way. Of uh, everything from anti-spam to, to antivirus to, to be able to scan those malicious attachments, endpoint uh, security, especially now in the tele in, in the tele workforce that we're dealing with, having um, you know managed endpoint security uh, from a, distri uh, you know, a distributed enterprise uh, angle is very important because all of these, you know, workstations that were within the corporate network before are now roaming, uh, quote unquote roaming or, um, you know, from, from home. So um, it, it's, it's, it's a multi-pronged approach really, but education is, is, is of course a, a very good line of defense for, for our employees and, and I think updated education on a weekly basis. Okay, before we get to the remote um, action steps, because I think the remote worker at scale is like the critical problem that we're seeing now. I want to just close out this attack, um, social engineering thing. Um, there's also phone-based attacks. We all have mobile phones, right? So we, uh, we use our smartphones. Um, there's other techniques in that. What are the techniques for the phone-based attacks? Yeah, a lot of times you'll see adversaries, they're spoofing um, other phones. Um, so what, what happens is that, you know, when you receive a call or a text, um, it looks like it's coming from a number, you know, in your local area. Um, so a lot of times, you know, that kind of gives you a false sense of, um, you know, security thinking that it is a legitimate call when in reality, um, they're simply just spoofing uh, the number. Um, and it's really coming from, you know, somewhere else in the country or somewhere else in the world. So I get a call from Apple support and it's not Apple support. They don't have a callback. That's spoofing. Um, that's one way, but also the number itself. When yeah. you see the number coming in, you know, you know, for example, I'm in uh, the 410 area code. Um, emails coming in to, from my area code with my exchange um, is another example where it looks like, you know, it's someone that's either, you know, a close friend or, um, you know, someone within my community, when in reality, it, it, it's not. And, and at the end of the day too, you know, the, the biggest red flags for these attacks are unsolicited information, yeah. right? If, they, if they're asking for any information, always, 
always treat that as a red flag. You know, um, we've seen this in the past, just, just as an example with call centers, uh, ho hotels too, where, you know, hackers have had access right to the switchboards to call guest rooms and say that they're, um, you know, there's a problem at, uh, at the front desk and they just want to register the user's information and they ask for a credit card you know, guest information to confirm those sorts of things. So again, anytime information is asked for, um, always think twice, try to verify. Callback numbers are a great thing. Um, same thing with social media, if someone's messaging you, right? Yeah. Try to engage in that in that dialect conversation, verify their identity. So you got... Yeah, and that's also another good example of, of social media is another form of essential engineering attacks is where people are creating fo create profiles um, in say, for example, LinkedIn and, you know, they're act Thing like they're either someone from your company or a former colleague or friend um, as, a, as another way to try and make that, you know, yeah. human to human connection in order to, you know, you know, do, do malicious things. Well, we've discussed with you guys in the past around LinkedIn as a, as a, a feeding ground for spear phishing because, hey, here, don't tell your boss, but here's a PDF resume job opening, paying huge salary, you're qualified. Of course, I'm going to look at it, right? So a lot of that goes on. We see that happen a lot. Um, I want to get your thoughts, Renee, on um, the, the vishing and phishing. They're the smishing is the legitimate source spoofing and vishing is the cloaking or spoofing, right? Yeah, smishing is really is is really the the text based attacks um, that you're seeing through through your phones. Vishing is using more of a combination of someone that is using a phone based attack, but also you know creating a fake profile, creating a persona, a fabricated story that's um, ultimately fake but believable, um, and to try and um, encourage you to provide you know information, um, you know sensitive inform information. Well, I really appreciate you guys coming on and talking about the attackers uh, trying to take advantage of the current situation. The remote workers, again, this is the big at scale thing. What are the steps that people can take, companies can take to protect themselves from the at scale remote worker situation that could be going on for quite some time now? Yeah, so again, at the, the at scale with people um, you know, in, in this new normal, as we call it, um, teleworking, you know, uh, being at scale uh, is, is I, everyone has to do their part. So I would recommend A, from, a, uh, from an IT standpoint, uh, I'm keeping all, all employees uh, virtually in the loop, so weekly updates from security teams. Um, the cyber hygiene practice, especially patch management is, is critically important too, right? You have a lot of these other devices connected to networks, like you said, um, you know, IOT devices, all these things that are all prime um, attack uh, targets. So keeping all, all the things that we've talked about before, like patch management, being vigilant on that uh, from, from an end user perspective, I think, um, especially putting it to the employees that they have to be aware that they are um, highly at risk for this. And, um, you know, I, I think there has to be, we, we talked about changes earlier in terms of mentality, education, cyber hygiene, that doesn't change. But I think the way that this is enforced now, that starts to change, right? That That's a big um, focus point, especially from a, uh, 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 from a, an IT uh, security standpoint. Well, Derek, keep that stat, keep those stats coming into us. We are very interested. You got the insights. You're the chief of the insights and the global threat. You guys do a great job at FortiGuard Labs. That's phenomenal. Renee, I'd like you to have the final word on the segment here, and, and we can get back to our remote working and living. Um, what is the in, going on in the mind of the CISO right now? Because again, a lot of people are concerned. They don't know how long it's going to last. Certainly, we're now in a new normal. Whatever happens going forward as a post-pandemic world, what's going on in the mind of the CISO right now? What are they thinking? What are they planning for? What's going on? Yeah, I think there's a lot of uncertainty. And I think, you know, um, the remote teleworking, um, again, making sure that, you know, employees have, you know, secure remote access that can scale. Um, I think that's going to be on the forefront. Um, but again, making sure that, you know, you know, people connecting remotely, um, again, don't are introducing you know, additional, um, you know, potential vulnerabilities into, into your network. Um, and again, just keeping aware, um, working closely with the IT teams to ensure that, you know, we keep our yeah. workforces updated um, and trained um, and continue to be vi vigilant, um, you know, with our monitoring uh, capabilities, um, as well as, um, you know, ensuring that, um, you know, we're prepared for, you know, yeah. potential attacks. Well, I appreciate your insights, folks here. This is great. 
uh, Renee and Derek, thanks for coming on. We want to bring you back in when we should do a digital event here in the studio and get the data out there. People are interested, people are making changes. Um, maybe this could be um, a good thing, make some lemonade out of the lemons that, that, are, that are in the industry right now. So thank you for taking the time to share what's going on inside from the cyber risks, thank you. Thank you, we'll keep those stats coming. Okay, CUBE conversation here in Palo Alto with the remote guests, that's what we're doing now. We are working remotely with all of our CUBE interviews. Thanks for watching, I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE.